Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Dr. Lucy Shapiro, who is director of the Beckman Center for Molecular and Genetic Medicine at Stanford University and the Ludwig Professor of Cancer Research in the School of Medicine there and a senior fellow of the Spogli Institute for International Studies, also at Stanford. She is the 2009 Hitchcock Professor at UC Berkeley. Professor Shapiro, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh huh. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, let's see, I'm a daughter of immigrants, and it was extremely important for my generation of immigrant children uh, to be very successful. And we were a poor household, but there was always somehow the wherewithal to give us piano lessons and dancing lessons and language lessons. And uh, academics was extremely important. And, and was, was science something you picked up at home, no. in high school, in no, college? No, no, not at all. In mm -hmm. fact, I have a, a very unusual background. So um, music was always very important in my household. My mother was a piano teacher and a, a public school teacher. Um, and my father was just always interested in the entire world. Mm -hmm. But music was important. And so I read music. I played the piano before I learned to read. Mm -hmm. My piano lesson started at the age of four. And it was a very, very much part of my life, but I knew that I wasn't a very good musician. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in the neighborhood in which I lived in Brooklyn, New York, uh, the high school I would have gone to, mandated, I think was called Manual Training High School, mm. where perhaps 2% of the population went on to college. So this was not an option. Clearly, private schools were not an option. But living in New York City hmm. is an incredible place mm -hmm. because there were public special high schools that were free. There mm -hmm. was the Bronx High School of Science. There was Stuyvesant. Uh, there was the High School of Music and Art. And so my parents said, this is perfect. Uh, you will try out. You know, there was a test. Mm -hmm. And they all assumed I would go for music. And a year before I was to take the test to get into music and art, I decided I do not want to play a musical instrument for four <laughs> years in high school. And so I went to the library and got a book, I remember that to this day, written by John Nagy hmm. on um, how to draw. I said, I'm going to learn how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. And I studied this book, and I prepared a whole portfolio. Fortunately. Fortunately, mm -hmm. I have some talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went off to my test at music and art and got in. Mm -hmm. And my parents were utterly astonished to find out that I had gotten in on painting. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my sort of taking left-hand turns everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, and, 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 the, and the science bug, uh, and I guess I should put no, that in. Yeah. There was no science at that point at all. Yeah. So <clears> when did that uh, come to Well, you? I went to music and art, and then I went to Brooklyn College where I was uh, put on a new program as a scholar. Mm -hmm. And as this, excuse me, <coughs> as this scholar, I didn't have to take classes. I could do whatever I wanted, mm -hmm. but, that I, but I reported to people. And during this time, <coughs> I became somewhat interested in biology, but I majored in fine arts. Mm. I was a Gee, painter. I see. And I also uh, mm. minored in the classics, wrote my senior thesis on Dante, Mm -hmm. and why he wrote in the vernacular and not Latin. I see. But I was interested somewhat in science. And then something amazing happened. Mm -hmm. When I was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when I was graduating from college, I was part of an art show. And a man named Ted Shedlovsky at Rockefeller University, who's a physical chemist, bought one of my paintings. Hmm. And Ted had this avocation in life of finding young people in the arts, getting to know them, deciding if they were smart, and then mm. convincing them to go into science. Gee. <laughs> yeah. Jerry Edelman, a Nobel Prize winner, is one of us Shedlovsky mm -hmm. kids. There are a whole bunch of us. Yeah. And he's a mentor. And he said, what you have to do is take a course in organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. I said, really? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I did. 
And it was an eye opener. Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And maybe because it's the way my head works, uh, I see things in three dimensions, but I thought organic chemistry was absolutely beautiful. And this is really what I wanted to do. And, and then where did you do your PhD work? So at that point, um, Ted uh, encouraged me to apply for graduate programs, mm. even though I had barely no mm. background to do so. I think Rutgers was my safe school, and they turned me down. Mm -hmm. But I got into almost everywhere else I applied, and I went to Albert Einstein. Well, it was New York University at the time. A year later, the whole department moved to Albert Einstein College of Medicine. But I was accepted. Mm -hmm. And my whole first year in graduate school was very unusual. You needed to take some uh, beginner courses to do the preparatory yes. work you hadn't done in college. I took a lot of math, mm -hmm. physics, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of chemistry. Uh, and I had the unusual opportunity of taking courses at different universities around the city. Mm -hmm. So my mentor at that time, uh, Tom August and mentors, and Jerry Hurwitz, a very well-known biochemist, helped me find the very best courses in the city. Oh, gee. <laughs> and so uh, I just had incredible training. Mm -hmm. And uh, chemi chemistry was really some of the most exciting things I had been exposed to. But I had to learn how to think analytically. Mm -hmm. So courses in physics and in quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics were really very important. And it was the first time in my life where I had to really work hard mm -hmm. to, you know, I remember doing problem sets, <laughs> mm -hmm. morning, noon, and night. Uh, but I did learn. Mm -hmm. And while this was going on, I was actually working in the laboratory. Mm. And, uh, so hands-on experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so this raises an interesting question, because you, you <clears throat> will talk about your research in a minute, but you're on the cutting edge of, of major breakthroughs in developmental mm -hmm. biology and genetics mm -hmm. uh, as you study bacteria. And I think uh, students in our audience would be interested in what it takes, the skill base involved yes. in what you do. You've already given us a, a hint of that, but talk a little about that. I mean, Well, let, let me come at it in a different angle. Okay. The fact that I went from fine arts and the classics to learning quantitative approaches to mm -hmm. science sort of gave me license to try to do different things hmm. and gave me the belief that I could do anything I wanted to do. Mm. So I was never on a track. And when I realized that I had to learn how to think quantitatively and analytically, uh, and it was hard work, then I knew I could approach any scientific question I wanted to approach, mm. whether it was in physics or chemistry or biology, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I was interested in the living world. Mm -hmm. Now, it raises an interesting question because as scientists who s appreciated your art and directed you into science, and then you were in music, is there a, is a, is, is, a, is there a landscape of the mind, let me say it this way, mm -hmm. in music and art that in addition to building self-confidence in you that you could do anything, what mm -hmm. you do, talk a little about that. Are, are these worlds not as different as we might think they are? Oh, I don't think they are really. Yeah. Uh, I think what we're uh, dealing with is creativity mm -hmm. and uh, the ability or the desire to think differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical. Mm -hmm. And what I found in writing about Dante and trying to understand what he did is I could get bits and pieces of anecdotal information and try to make a logical construct. Mm -hmm. But once I was working in the science domain, there was a lot more hard data. And mm -hmm. I could take this hard data and what I like to say is build stories, mm -hmm. build supposements, build mm -hmm. ways of thinking and then try very hard to disprove mm -hmm. what I think I'm purporting to be true. And that's the key of doing mm -hmm. really good science. Mm -hmm. Get your theory, get your hypothesis, get your idea, collect data, of course to support it, but then try very hard to find out if you can knock it down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like a detective story. Mm -hmm. You collect clues. And I think that that kind of approach to anything, whether it's worrying about Dante's opus or worrying about the bacterial cell cycle is what I ultimately mm -hmm. studied, 
<clears throat> is, is, is an extremely valuable and not unusual way that scientists approach what they do. And, and so, so, that, so that in this creative process, you're really turning what might be self-doubt into a tool mm -hmm. to, to sharpen uh, uh, your hypothesis and right. your assertions. That's great, that's great. Uh, and, and, and I guess that, that uh, it, it was, it, in, in retrospect, it turns out to be a real virtue that you weren't tracked early oh, yes. at, in the sciences. Yes, and, and I think it's really fairly unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, frequently now we see people coming from the science, some um, physics and chemistry and going into biology, because that's pretty, pretty exciting right now. Uh, rarely do you, do you see it the other way. Do you mm -hmm. see people from humanities going into science? And that's a pity, mm -hmm. because certainly it can be done. And uh, it's easier to do it in the United States than in Europe, which is which, where the education is much more channeled, or, or in Asia. You just don't see this kind of freedom mm -hmm. to change. But I think it's extremely important that, that people keep an open mind about what they might want to do, or mm -hmm. how they might want to do it. And there are no rules and regulations. You can learn how mm -hmm. to think differently at any stage in your life. Mm -hmm. And it also gave me the freedom at every stage of my scientific career to learn a different kind of science. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I could apply many, many different ways of thinking, many different disciplines mm -hmm. to one question. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate in that after I finished my PhD, which was in molecular biology and in which I discovered a new RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, uh, and I was really trained as a biochemist, when I, uh, I did a short postdoc for only six months and then was offered an assistant professorship back in the department that I had gotten my PhD in. And the uh, chair at the time said, why don't you take three months and mm -hmm. think about what you want to work on. Mm. This hardly ever happens anymore. Mm -hmm. Usually mm. you're, you're really tracked in. People do three years, four years of postdoctoral work. Well, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And that three months of thinking and reading was just incredible. Mm. And I had decided at that point that if I was going to spend my life working on a scientific problem, it had to be something I was passionate about. Mm -hmm. and it seemed to me at that time that I wanted to understand what it meant to be a living thing. And I tried to find the simplest cell I could study, mm -hmm. which turned out to be a bacterial cell, and study that cell as if I were a systems engineer, mm -hmm. taking it apart in all of its parameters and then putting it back together again. Of course, I'm speaking metaphorically, sure. but we've been able to, in fact, do it mm -hmm. much more than metaphorically, mm -hmm. and understand how a living entity, all the things it does to go from one cell to two cells and mm -hmm. be alive, mm -hmm. is completely integrated. It's, it, it's like an absolutely beautiful machine. Mm -hmm. And so I dedicated my life to figuring this out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and let's talk a little about that because mm -hmm. Uh, in in your work in, and in your lecture yesterday, you you showed us a DNA in a bacteria, mm -hmm. and you know it's, it's it's beautiful, you know, on the screen and so on. But it looks like a bundle where sort of nothing is going on, and mm -hmm. and 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 your work really was, uh, 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 and your lecture describing that work, it, it was kind of unbelievable for a person who's not a scientist like myself, to, to <coughs> see the, this intricate machine that, mm -hmm. that lies hidden there. Yes, it, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. truly amazing. But you have to realize that this is the result of almost 40 years of work. Yeah. And uh, working with over 50 talented postdocs and 40 talented graduate students who are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, we work, we work in the lab as a team and we share ideas and thoughts constantly. Mm -hmm. For example, in our lab, <clears throat> every Tuesday, we sit for two hours, the entire interdisciplinary lab, mm -hmm. all 22 of us. People, it, there are people in the lab who are getting their degrees in physics, in chemistry, mm -hmm. in genetics, in biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And we talk and we think. 
one person presents their work, and they have to make sure that everyone sitting there understands their language. And then we tackle a problem, and we troubleshoot this problem. So mm. the, the work that has come out is the cumulative output mm -hmm. of almost generations mm -hmm. of incredibly talented young people. To help us understand the creative mm. moment, maybe mm -hmm. a creative moment that, that was very important for you and, and your reaction as, uh, uh, as you realized mm -hmm. what you've come upon, you and your team have come uh, upon. Well, let me give you an example. Yeah. Okay, I could give you many, yeah. but I'll, I'll give you one. So it's known, it was always known, that the bacterial cell has free-floating DNA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bacterial cell is very little. But the DNA, if it's stretched out, is a thousand times longer than the cell. Mm -hmm. So it's compacted inside this cell. Mm -hmm. And it was always thought that it was sort of smunched together mm -hmm. like a ball of spaghetti into the cell. That when it duplicated, it somehow got copied attached to the inside of the bacterial cell wall, and as the cell grew, it pulled it apart. Mm -hmm. right? To me, this seemed hmm. not logical. It wasn't, hmm. it wasn't what hmm. nature would do. It was not clean. And hmm. we knew that while the cell has to duplicate this mess of DNA, it also has to transfer the information in it. So you have to copy out the messages that are encoded in this thing. So, so much is going on, it cannot be a random stochastic process. Mm -hmm. And so we all sat and thought about it a lot. And we showed that at least one part of the chromosome was attached to one pole of the cell, and the other part of the chromosome at the other pole. And then we said, well, can we design an experiment in which we put a fluorescent tag on many, 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 many different genetic loci all around the chromosome, hmm. and followed it by doing very, very sophisticated microscopy. So we all got together and worked on this, and we realized that it would take 10 students 50 years sitting in the dark room to take pictures constantly of hmm. these fluorescent signals. But if we automated this, and if we designed a microscope and a computerized system that could analyze the data for us, we could tag up in, in each of, hmm. you know, 115 different cells, tag a different spot on the chromosome, and then have computer-aided technology solve the whole thing, it would work. Hmm. And we did just this. Mm -hmm. And what it did in one experiment hmm. was get rid of this fog of what people thought was going hmm. on, showed it was completely wrong, Mm -hmm. that the chromosome, in fact, is highly organized. Mm -hmm. You know, where a gene is on the chromosome reflects where it sits in the cell. And that when you start copying this chromosome, as you copy a region, it jumps to its correct place. So in one experiment, mm -hmm. we were able to truly understand something that had been guessed at for years and years. And that is an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. And and what 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 uh, as you as this happens is is it it's an awe, I guess uh, that that just sort of drives you to want to find more another more. El yeah, oh, an element. Yeah, an element. Yeah. So look, uh, most of a scientific career is tedium, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, being anxious, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, a lot of thinking, a lot of dead ends, a lot of blind alleys, and periodically mm -hmm. there's that wonderful moment when you see something clearly and you know it's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all have this. There are not a lot of those. Uh, but they, they're so wonderful that it feeds this passion mm -hmm. and you want more and more of it and for us, we just kept digging deeper and deeper into understanding this wonderful machine that we call life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's just been very exciting. Now, uh, th this part of your work uh, has a, a beauty, a quietness, mixed with anxiety, you just said. But, mm -hmm. but you, you focused on bacteria. 
Mm -hmm. And bacteria has led you to also focus beyond your science onto some big issues of public policy because, mm -hmm. you know, in this new century, we're uh, in a world where things like bioterrorism, the, the failure of antibiotics, the, the fact that, that bacteria are, 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 as you say, engineers themselves, are all coming together mm -hmm. to, complete, complete a, a, to, uh, to give us a, a complex set of problems that are, are really quite difficult. I mean, and, and you're worried about that. Yes, I, I think that what started me on this is that I felt that there had to be an informed public. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, decisions were being made or not made at all about issues that impacted our lives, the lives of our children, the lives of our grandchildren. And it was very important to me to do two things. To number one, understand deeply what was happening and what could be done. And number two, convey this to the public. And by the public, I mean not only the lay people who are interested in what's going on, but people in government, mm -hmm. people in the pharmaceutical industry. So I began uh, being on boards of biotechs and pharmaceutical houses, advising the government, and reading and learning as much as I could. And uh, for many years, I worked very hard to learn how to speak to an intelligent lay public in English mm -hmm. about complicated subjects. And what worried me most was my view that we were entering what I call the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And the perfect storm being increases, increasing appearance of a new infectious diseases and old pathogens in new places. Mm -hmm. and it, such as SARS or... Su such, as, such as West Nile virus, yeah. such as Ebola, such as SARS, such as AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, lots. Mm -hmm. And we, as citizens of the United States, had to realize that we were now part of a global community mm -hmm. and that we are no longer just protecting our borders. We live on one globe and there are no borders. Mm -hmm. Someone can be in Kenya one day and Chicago the next. Mm -hmm. And, and drug-resistant bugs and diseases travel 24 hours anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we had this instance where we have increasing infectious disease on the one hand. On the other hand, we have increasing resistance to our drugs, increasing resistance to our antibacterials, which are called antibiotics, and to our antivirals, mm -hmm. like Tamiflu for influenza. And number one, we have to understand this resistance. Number two, we have to know how to get around it. And we have to alter our healthcare system to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So that's another part of the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Then there's the part of the perfect storm where it isn't financially appealing to design new antibiotics, because if you get a new one, it's gonna be put on the shelf and saved until the other ones stop working. And then it has a lifetime. It doesn't go on forever because resistance is going to occur. So that the profit motive in antibiotics is not terribly high. Mm -hmm. So now that has been left to biotechs and we're doing it. Uh, but to me, it's probably one of the most important things we do. Now at the same time that all of this is going on, we had 2001 and the anthrax scare, and there have been blips of bioterrorism happen, bio happening through, through time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from throwing putrefied corpses over the walls of old castles to in measles-infected blankets to Indians. Uh, this is not brand new. I mean, this mm -hmm. has been done for centuries. Uh, but it does appear in our lifetime. We have to know about it. Fortunately, the preparative work that must be done for both the problem of natural infectious mm -hmm. diseases emerging and bioterrorism is the same. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to identify your pathogen, you have to be able to have an antidote to that, and you must understand the laws of quarantine, which we do a very bad job on. Mm -hmm. now, now, I want to break this apart and, and pick out some of the key points here. One is the bacteria 
that you know will be the focus of our attention in 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 in, in what we've been talking about. They are very smart creatures, mm. <laughs> basically. So so and and you you say that that in a way they they're they're very good biological engineers. So they're at work as we are creating a new you know, world. So I think that when we talk about how smart the bugs are, uh, I think we have to understand what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. uh, bugs are smart because they've been going through billions of years of evolution. They duplicate very rapidly, mm -hmm. under an hour, sometimes under a half an hour, making a whole new set of bugs. And they have the ability to design new ways of getting around problems constantly. So if you look at the evolution of mammals and humans, and you look at the evolution of these little tiny bugs that are reproducing constantly, you can just speed up evolution. And because of that, they can design all kinds of new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So that they have figured out ways of dealing with antibiotics so that they design a mechanism to not let the antibiotic in, or to let it in, but then spit it out, mm -hmm. or to let it in and then modify it chemically. And their bag of tricks is truly amazing. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they're dealing with an adversary, us, that uh, is both abusing the use of antibiotics as we mm -hmm. give it to more and more animals that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for consumption, uh, 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 on the one hand, but then on uh, uh, the other hand, we're overusing them in, in the treatment of illnesses that may not even be caused by bacteria. That's true. And, and so I think that it's a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. It's really a wake-up call. Uh, we do have many antibiotics that are still functioning, but there are many pathogens that are resistant to all of them. So it's become absolutely critical that we now really rein in our use of antibiotics uh, for our livestock, for our plants in orchards, mm -hmm. uh, for humans, and make sure that we use them appropriately and carefully. And this is a big problem because it crosses all kinds of political and legal boundaries. And I think that people are beginning to deal with it, but not enough. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, when, when you get into the world of bioterrorism, and, and you said something very important for our audience, namely that if we deal with this biological problem, that smart bacteria, our mm -hmm. abuse of, of antibi antibodies, uh, antibiotics, on the one hand, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, you still have the problem that these two worlds, bioterrorism on the one hand, the real threat that's emerging biologically, they get intermingled. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we say there's a threat from bioterrorism, but there isn't. But mm -hmm. what you're trying to emphasize is that if we deal with one, we also deal with the Abs other. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and also we have to be cognizant of the fact of a very minor bioterrorism effect, uh, attack, mm -hmm. let's say um, anthrax, and bioterrorism can come from anywhere, inside or outside the country, uh, will cause an enormous fear response, mm -hmm. have an enormous economic impact. Look what happened with SARS, mm -hmm. all right? SARS really did not kill a lot of people. It was not huge, but the fear impact was huge, mm -hmm. and there was a major worldwide economic disruption as a result of that. So that if a relatively minor quote unquote attack, this happened to be natural, not malevolent, would cause such havoc, then it doesn't take much mm -hmm. to do something that is uh, very worrisome and not on a grand scale. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what would you like to see happen, uh, it, it, you know, looking into the future in, in in dealing with this set of problems, because you're dealing with making people afraid, mm -hmm. which can uh, have uh, negative consequences. But on the other hand, you do want to educate them. I think yeah. you said in something where in, uh, I read uh, Clorox is, is yeah. something that everybody has at the, in their home that could be used. If, so, if, yeah. so I think that this can be done on a number of levels. 
Uh, number one, an educated public is the most important. An educated public is less fearsome mm -hmm. than one that's not. And I think that we as scientists uh, have a responsibility to speak as frequently and as carefully to the public as we possibly can about what we know and not put it in terms of being terrified, but rather this is what we can do. So we can start with us in our homes, knowing how to protect ourselves, uh, knowing that we should have Clorox around mm -hmm. uh, if we want to clean surfaces, uh, that we should wash our hands all the time, that if there is some sort of uh, epidemic of flu or something else, simple face masks work very well, which they do in Asia all the time. That's home. Mm -hmm. uh, stay out of crowds. Uh, but more than that, the next level is our physicians and our hospitals. Uh, Hospital-acquired infections are huge. And in Sweden, they learned how to deal with this by instituting very rigorous standards of cleanliness, constantly cleaning your hands, being very diligent about not going from one patient to another with dirty hands. Uh, and, you know, antibiotics through, through this generation of ours has made us feel sort of, well, we can always take a pill and mm. we'll be fine. Well, those pills are going away. And so we have to go back to the time of careful, careful hygiene. And now this is happening again. And American hospitals are just beginning to realize, my God, we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. And they're dealing with it by instituting very, very careful regimes of cleanliness again. So that's another level. Mm -hmm. Then you move from that level to the government level. And there you say, well, we have to have more research going on for antibiotic discovery. We need more research to find out why these things are becoming, uh, why these pathogens are becoming resistant. Uh, to do that, we need oversight and cognizance of the problem at the government level. Mm -hmm. So money can be put into that mm -hmm. as a priority. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is somewhat happening, but not enough. And it's important to have uh, an administration in place that appreciates science. Mm -hmm. and, and basic that, research. Yes, and, that, and, and realize that it's not just, oh, this is what I do for a living, give me more money. Mm -hmm. It's much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. and, and that in many ways, we're working for the common good. Mm -hmm. And we have to have a, a political system that can intelligently respond mm -hmm. to what scientists are trying to say, whether it's uh, world health, whether it's climate, whether it's energy, any of these. And there are arguments on both sides and all of these things. But with respect to health, and antibiotic resistance and emerging mm -hmm. infectious diseases, this is not a polemic. Mm -hmm. This is a problem here and now. Mm -hmm. You know, the canaries are dropping dead. <laughs> yeah, right. and <laughs> and, more than one, yeah. And, yeah, and, and it's, it's become really critical that we do something. Uh, is, how do we deal with the conundrum that when you put all this together, you get uh, a policy maker, let's say the former vice president who focuses on one problem, mm -hmm. you know, to the detriment of what the scientific community might say, oh no, this is where we need mm -hmm. to go. There's a threat from smallpox. Mm -hmm. We understand that and so on, but, but we really need to unlock mm -hmm. these secrets. And then we have the individual scientists like yourself who, whose whole creativity lies in your uh, ability mm -hmm. to see things uh, in a way out of where science may be going mm -hmm. and, and look at it from an entirely different perspective. It's a lot to put together. Yeah, no, but I, I think that what you're saying is that our political system uh, must have people in it who can integrate across many different problems. We always have many, mm -hmm. many problems happening simultaneously. It's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of uh, deciding what's good for your country because that's what the political system is doing. It's taking care of our country. Mm -hmm. And 
different people have different thoughts as to what's, what, where to place problems on the priority list. Mm -hmm. And my belief is that what we as scientists can do, scientists and technologists in many different areas, is at least provide information. Now, we can provide all the information that's possible, but it has to enter a receptive ear. Mm -hmm. And somehow, we as a country have to understand and prioritize problems. And I'm not going to enter this political fray. Mm -hmm. uh, I can only speak as one humble scientist, knowing that we have a problem mm -hmm. and doing the best I can to approach this. And in addition to speaking to people advising the government, which I have done. Uh, at the same time, I decided that I could take my knowledge base and design new antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So to do that, I hooked up with a chemist, a wonderful chemist at Penn State named Steve Benkovic, and we designed a whole new library of potential antibiotics. And we built a small biotech company out here in California Mm -hmm. And we have designed the first new antifungal in 25 years. Mm -hmm. Companies called Anacor, Anacor Pharmaceuticals, and uh, two very early stage antibiotics. But I think that's our responsibility mm -hmm. to not only have the wonderful freedom to muck around the insides of cells mm -hmm. and figure out how they work, but to actually take our knowledge and apply it mm -hmm. so that we can, in fact, help humanity. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is a very important thing in one's life. Mm -hmm. It sounds very important. And, and I'm just curious, what do you see as the, the next place for scientists to look? In, in the, I mean, what, what, what is down the road, that, a puzzle that, that you would like to open up? Well, I think that um, there are two things. For me, and I'll go down the road in my area mm -hmm. and in my field, energy, how to create new energy using the algorithms mm. and the ideas and designs that living systems use. Mm. To try to do that, there's this new field called synthetic biology. And what does that mean? It means taking uh, ways of doing things from one little bug or one organism and putting it in another one so that you could, for example, break down cellulose and make fuel. Now, that sounds pretty simplistic, and it is. Mm -hmm. And the problem is you can't just move some genes from one mm -hmm. thing to another, even though you know it can do it, mm -hmm. possibly. What you have to understand, and what our own work has shown, is that there is a very complex genetic network, a circuitry, of feedback loops and mm. regulatory mechanisms that must be understood as little functional modules. Mm. So you can't expect just to take a bunch of genes from here and put it into mm. another organism to give you biofuels and expect it to boot up. It's not going to boot up because you have to understand the intricate ways in which all these functions interact with one another. Mm -hmm. And to me, the future is helping us take lessons from mm. the natural world, mm. understand enough about the exquisite complexity mm -hmm. that goes on even in the simplest living creature, and take a lesson from that mm -hmm. and say, oh my goodness, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. And then we can build that. Mm -hmm. And that's synthetic biology. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that that is a frontier. And, and you said a second one? Was there a second one or it was just that one? That well, that's the one I'm very excited yeah, about right yeah, now. Yeah. The second, of course, and is not my field, is neural networks. Yeah. Understanding how the brain works. Using our brains to think about how we work. Mm -hmm. And again, it's of incredible complexity. But you take a complex program and you break it down into its individual parts and you figure out how it works. Mm -hmm. And to me, the most beautiful thing, possibly in my life, is uncovering and learning about how these quote unquote simple organisms actually work. Mm -hmm. It's staggeringly beautiful. 
One, one final question uh, requiring a brief answer. How would you advise students who are excited by what you've just said? How, how should they prepare for a future in these fields? And what should they do besides going to art school and music <laughs> school? <laughs> uh, look, I, I think that um, some of it takes a lot of just plain hard elbow grease, as I did in my first year in graduate school. Take courses in the analytical sciences. Uh, take math. Take calculus. Understand chemistry and physics. Biology is now, in my view, the chemistry and physics of a living thing. Uh, and try to work so that you're not afraid to approach any problem. And, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm sitting at the bottom of Mount Everest mm -hmm. and, oh my God, how am I ever going to learn all that stuff so I can apply this or that technology to the question I want to answer? Well, take it in little, in little packets. Learn how to do one thing. Apply it to something else. Learn how to do that. Apply that to something else. And another important thing that we haven't spoken about is having mentors as you move through mm -hmm. life. Having Ted Shedlovsky was an incredible mentor. I never would be here today if it weren't for him. A wonderful scientist named Barbara McClintock, when I was a young graduate student, had a major impact on my life. Just by talking to these people, understanding how they work, understanding what their life was like. You know, many young women say, oh, how can I have a life of a scientist and still be a mother and, you know, a real person in many aspects? And you've done it. And you can do it. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy, but, you know, nothing in life that's really worth it is easy. On that uh, note, uh, Dr. Shapiro, I want to thank you very much for being on the My campus pleasure. and for appearing on our program. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.